The True Believer, Thoughts on the Nature of Mass Movements by Eric Koffer. This is Part 3, Section 2, Chapter 4, Passage 18, The Role of the Undesirables in Human Affairs. There is a tendency to judge a race, a nation, or any distinct group by its least worthy members. Though manifestly unfair, this tendency has some justification, for the character and destiny of a group are often determined by its inferior elements. The inert mass of a nation, for instance, is in its middle section. The decent, average people who do the nation's work in cities and on the land are worked upon and shaped by minorities at both ends, the best and the worst. The superior individual, whether in politics, literature, science, commerce, or industry, plays a large role in shaping a nation. But so do individuals at the other extreme, the failures, misfits, outcasts, criminals, and all those who have lost their footing, or never had one, in the ranks of respectable humanity. The game of history is usually played by the best and the worst over the heads of the majority in the middle. The reason that the inferior elements of a nation can exert a marked influence on its course is that they are wholly without reverence toward the present. They see their lives and the present as spoiled beyond remedy. They are ready to waste and wreck both. Hence their recklessness and their will to chaos and anarchy. They also crave to dissolve their spoiled, meaningless selves in some soul-stirring, spectacular communal undertaking. Hence, their proclivity for united action. Thus, they are among the early recruits of revolutions, mass migrations, and of religious, racial, and chauvinist movements, and they imprint their mark upon these upheavals and movements which shape a nation's character and history. The discarded and rejected are often the raw material of a nation's future. The stone the builders reject becomes the cornerstone of a new world. A nation without dregs and malcontents is orderly, decent, peaceful, and pleasant, but perhaps without the seed of things to come. It was not the irony of history that the undesired in the countries of Europe should have crossed an ocean to build a new world on this continent. Only they could do it. 19. Though the disaffected are found in all walks of life, they are most frequent in the following categories. A. The poor. B. Misfits. C. Outcasts. D. Minorities. E. Adolescent youth. F. The ambitious. Whether facing insurmountable obstacles or unlimited opportunities. G, those in the grip of some vice or obsession. H, the impotent in body or mind. I, the inordinately selfish. J, the bored. K, the sinners. Sections 20 through 42 deal with some of these types. Chapter 5, The Poor, The New Poor. 20. Not all who are poor are frustrated. Some of the poor stagnating in the slums of the cities are smug in their decay. They shudder at the thought of life outside their familiar cesspool. Even the respectable poor, when their poverty is of long standing, remain inert. They are awed by the immutability of the order of things. It takes a cataclysm, an invasion, a plague, or some other communal disaster to open their eyes to the transitoriness of the eternal order. It is usually those whose poverty is relatively recent, the new poor, who throb with the ferment of frustration. The memory of better things is as fire in their veins. They are the disinherited and dispossessed who respond to every rising mass movement. It was the new poor in the 17th century England who ensured the success of the Puritan Revolution. During the movement of enclosure, thousands of landlords drove off their tenants and turned their fields into pastures. Quote, strong and active peasants, enamored of the soil that nurtured them, 
were transformed into wage workers or sturdy beggars. City streets were filled with paupers. End quote. It was this mass of the dispossessed who furnished the recruits for Cromwell's new model army. In Germany and Italy, the new poor coming from a ruined middle class formed the chief support of the Nazi and fascist revolutions. The potential revolutionaries in present-day England are not the workers, but the disinherited civil servants and businessmen. This class has a vivid memory of affluence and dominion and is not likely to reconcile itself to straightened conditions and political impotence. There have been of late, both here and in other countries, enormous periodic increases of a new type of new poor, and their appearance undoubtedly has contributed to the rise and spread of contemporary mass movements. Until recently, the new poor came mainly from the propertied classes, whether in cities or on the land, but lately, and perhaps for the first time in history, the plain working man appears in this role. So long as those who did the world's work lived on a level of bare subsistence, they were looked upon and felt themselves as the traditionally poor. They felt poor in good times and bad. Depressions, however severe, were not seen as aberrations and enormities. But with the wide diffusion of a high standard of living, depressions and the unemployment they bring assumed a new aspect. The present-day working man in the Western world feels unemployment as a degradation. He sees himself disinherited and injured by an unjust order of things and is willing to listen to those who call for a new deal. The Abjectly Poor Number 21 The poor on the borderline of starvation live purposeful lives. To be engaged in a desperate struggle for food and shelter is to be wholly free from a sense of futility. The goals are concrete and immediate. Every meal is a fulfillment. To go to sleep on a full stomach is a triumph, and every windfall a miracle. What need could they have for an inspiring super-individual goal which would give meaning and dignity to their lives? They are immune to the appeal of a mass movement. Angelica Balabanov describes the effect of abject poverty on the revolutionary ardor of famous radicals who flocked to Moscow in the early days of the Bolshevik Revolution. Quote, Here I saw men and women who had lived all their lives for ideas, who had volunteered, renounced material advantages, liberty, happiness, and family affection for the realization of their ideals, completely absorbed by the problem of hunger and cold. End quote. Where people toil from sunrise to sunset for a bare living, they nurse no grievances and dream no dreams. One of the reasons for the unrebelliousness of the masses in China is the inordinate effort required there to scrape together the means of the scantiest subsistence. The intensified struggle for existence is a static rather than a dynamic influence. Number 22. Misery does not automatically generate discontent nor is the intensity of discontent directly proportionate to the degree of misery. Discontent is likely to be highest when misery is bearable, when conditions have so improved that an ideal state seems almost within reach. A grievance is most poignant when almost redressed. De Tocqueville, in his researches into the state of society in France before the revolution, was struck by the discovery that, quote, in no one of the periods which have followed the revolution of 1789 has the national prosperity of France augmented more rapidly than it did in the 20 years preceding that event, End quote. He is forced to conclude that, quote, the French found their position, the more intolerable, the better it became, End quote. In both France and Russia, the land-hungry peasants owned almost exactly one-third of the agricultural land at the outbreak of revolution, and most of that land was acquired during the generation or two preceding the revolution. It is not actual suffering, but the taste of better things, which excites people to revolt. A popular upheaval in Soviet Russia is hardly likely before the people get a real taste of the good life. The most dangerous moment for the regime of the Politburo 
will be when a considerable improvement in the economic conditions of the Russian masses has been achieved and the iron totalitarian rule somewhat relaxed. It is of interest that the assassination in December 1934 of Stalin's close friend Kirov happened not long after Stalin had announced the successful end of the first five-year plan and the beginning of a new, prosperous, joyous era. The intensity of discontent seems to be in inverse proportion to the distance from the object fervently desired. This is true whether we move toward a goal or away from it. It is true both of those who have just come within sight of the promised land and of the disinherited who are still within sight of it both of the about-to-be-rich, free, etc., and of the new poor and those recently enslaved. Number 23. Our frustration is greater when we have much and want more than when we have nothing and want some. We are less satisfied when we lack many things than when we seem to lack but one thing. Number 24. We dare more when striving for superfluities than for necessities. Often, when we renounce superfluities, we end up lacking in necessities. Number 25. There is a hope that acts as an explosive and a hope that disciplines and infuses patience. The difference is between the immediate hope and the distant hope. A rising mass movement preaches the immediate hope. It is intent on stirring its followers to action. And it is the -the around-the-corner brand of hope that prompts people to act. Rising Christianity preached the immediate end of the world and the kingdom of heaven around the corner. Muhammad dangled loot before the faithful. The Jacobins promised immediate liberty and equality. The early Bolsheviks promised bread and land. Hitler promised an immediate end to Versailles' bondage and work and action for all. Later, as the movement comes into possession of power, the emphasis is shifted to the distant hope, the dream, and the vision. For an arrived mass movement is preoccupied with the preservation of the present, and it prizes obedience and patience above spontaneous action. And when we, quote, hope for what we see not, then... We do with patience wait for it, end quote. Every established mass movement has its distant hope, its brand of dope to dull the impatience of the masses and reconcile them with their lot in life. Stalinism is as much an opium of the people as are the established religions.